Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, welcome to another uh, CMC webinar. Um, this one is going to be a little bit different than the last one. It's not going to be about a specific app, but it's about topic that I think is uh, as important as understanding your navigation app on your phone or your GPS. Um, before that, I'd like to um, remind you guys that if you have a Garmin or you uh, want to buy a Garmin, you don't want to miss next week um, because next week we have Barbara Auden talk about uh, Garmin devices and um, what they can do for you basically. So uh, we're going to get really into detail uh, in, in terms of um, how your Garmin works, what all those menus mean that you see when you turn it on. So uh, if you have a Garmin, I'm sure you will learn something. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I have a, I had a Garmin since I don't even know when. Um, I'm thinking on, on my third generation. So um, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So don't forget next week, same time, all about Garmin and how to operate it. Um, that said, um, I want to hand it over to Gary LeCain, who has graciously agreed to do a, a webinar about public lands. Um, something we all use one way, shape or form. And I don't think, uh, at least I don't know enough about them, um, the history as well as what the regulations are on them in terms of camping or hiking permits or whatever. So I'm looking forward to this one. And um, I saw the slide deck already. So I'm having a leg, leg up on you guys. Um, and it's uh, stock full of uh, really good information. So uh, Gary, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Gary LeCain. Uh, I'm a native of Montana and uh, spent most of my life in the West, Montana, Idaho, California, uh, Colorado, and I've always camped. Uh, I was a Forest Service brat. That is, my dad was with the Forest Service, so I grew up with foresters and hiking and camping in the National Forest, so just over the decades, I've collected some knowledge of, of our federal lands and what you can use them for and what not. So I was asked to put together this little talk and this is it. So I thought we'd go into a little bit of history and some of the key legislation relating to our federal lands, the federal agencies that manage our lands, and then the Colorado state lands. So we'll get started here. This is a nice old map that uh, I always get a kick out of. But these are the land claims that the 13 original colonies had in 1776. And you can see what they did was they pretty much just stretched their land claims all the way to the Mississippi River. And Massachusetts, which is now tiny, was pretty rambunctious in claiming this area and all the way to the Mississippi. Virginia even claimed up what the Great Lakes regions now. But uh, this is the land claims as of 1776 when we declared independence. After independence, the predominantly governing 1785 General Land Ordinance Act was passed. And this said that the 13 states' western boundaries would be restricted and the public land service system of the United States would be defined. The land was to be surveyed into square townships, six miles by six miles. Each township was subdivided into 36 sections, each one a square mile or 640 acres. Um, some of the original 13 st states kept a little different mapping system, but this is what we still use today as defined by 1785 General Land Ordinance Act. That act also convinced the 13 states to give up their western lands. And this became the first of our federal land systems here, west of the original 13 states, but east of the Mississippi River. This is the Mississippi River right here. They didn't do this out of altruism. In return, the federal government agreed to take over all the debts 
that the 13 states had accumulated uh, during the Revolutionary War. And then the plan was for the federal government to survey, document, and then sell this land. Some of the key legislation dealing with our federal lands are these right here. And these are just a few, but I thought these were the uh, key legislations. The 1785 General Land Ordinance Act, which established the federal land system. The 1862 Homestead Act, which granted 160 acres of federal land uh, to a farmer if you stayed on it for a certain number of years. The 1862 Railroad Act, which gave the railroads every other section extending five miles north and south of the tracks. The 1872 General Mining Act, which allows companies and individuals to mine on federal land and claim federal land. The 1897 Organic Act, this established the protection of the forest reserves. The 1906 Antiquities Act, which allowed, this was Teddy Roosevelt's act, and allowed the declaration of national monuments. The 1934 Taylor Grazing Act set up our U.S. Grazing Service, which was to become the BLM. And in 1964, we had my favorite act, which was the Wilderness Act which established the wilderness areas, areas predominantly in the U.S. Forest Service, but for all federal land management. The U.S. Forest Service just jumped on it quickest and did the best job, in my opinion, in defining and setting aside wilderness areas. The 2000 and 2009 National Landscape Conservation System Act is an extension of this Wilderness Act. And directed the BLM to sort of try and catch up and establish some more wilderness areas and a lot of BLM land, which was probably eligible, but hadn't been considered. These are the four federal land agencies that really govern our national forests, our park lands, our BLM lands, all of it. And they were, created in these periods here. 1905 was the creation of the U.S. Forest Service under Gifford Pinchot with management authority over 193 million acres. Um, Gifford Pinchot was sort of the grandfather forester of the Forest Service. He established it. He trained the early Forest Service people. He surveyed and identified and allocated the forests that we've got all over, especially Colorado, the Arapaho, the Roosevelt. The 1916 Organic Act created the National Park Service with responsibility for national parks, battlefields, historic places, and monuments, presently responsible for 81 million acres. Before the National Park Service, it was actually the Army that managed the few national parks that we had. In 1940, the legislation created the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and that was to conserve, protect, and, protect and enhance fish, wildlife, plants. They're responsible for 91 million acres. And in 1946, the BLM was created. Now, this was a compilation of the General Land Office, which had been created back in 1785, and the U.S. Grazing Service. They're responsible for the largest amount of land managed in the United States, with 247 million acres. They also manage the resources, minerals, oil, natural gas, on the BLM land, Fish and Wildlife, the Park Service, and the Forest Service land. Um, so they manage resources on 700 million acres of mineral rights. To give this some idea, the lower 48 states is about 2 billion acres. So 700 million, a third of that 2 billion acres of the lower 48 states. And here's the land and how it's divvied up. You can see the Bureau of Land Management, which 
manages the largest area here in the uh, yellowish brown, then the Forest Service in the dark green, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which you can't see much of because they're such small areas, really, and the National Park Service in this red. Here's the, here's the Everglades down here. Here's Yellowstone and Yosemite, which are the biggest, around 2 million acres. Glacier National Park, my favorite. Um, the Grand Tetons, this little dot right there is Rocky Mountain National Park. So what they end up with is a national federal public land management of U.S. Forest Service with 193 million acres, BLM at 247, the Park Service at 81 million acres, but notice that 52 million acres of that is in Alaska. And with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 91 million acres, again, 74 million of that is in Alaska. Again, for some comparison, the lower 48 state is 2 billion acres. Colorado is 67 million acres. Yellowstone National Park is 2 million acres. So you can see we're talking about huge areas of land. And here's Colorado. In this case, the blue is the Bureau of Land Management. And this is more the grazing lands out on the western slope. The U.S. Forest Service, the dark green, you can see occupying most of the Rocky Mountains and the national and the forested lands. The white is private. The red is the state lands. And then the yellow is other federal agencies, which includes the national parks. Here we've got Rocky Mountain National Park, Dinosaur, um, this is the great sand dunes down here. You notice that these little red dots are scattered all over in a fairly organized pattern. This has to do with uh, the granting of state lands uh, when a state is, is formed. Colorado became a state in 1876, and part of becoming a state, my federal lands were granted to the state to allow it to sell or use resources of to fund the state government. And that's why we have this, this scattered. It's actually one square mile for every township, for every 36 square miles. In Colorado, we've got the US Forest Service managing 14.4 million, BLM 8.3, Park Service 0.7, Keeping in mind Colorado is about 67 million acres, you can see that the U.S. Forest Service manages a huge amount of land in the state of Colorado. This is a listing of, of the federal land in Colorado. See, we have four national parks, Rocky Mountain being the most predominant of them. We have eight monuments, plus we have a selection of recreation areas, historic sites, scenic trails. We have 11 national forests here with two national grasslands that are out in the eastern part of the state. Some wildlife refuges and conservation areas. This is a law here that I think has really improved the management of land in the West. This is the Wilderness Act of 1964 and what it defined was an area where the earth and community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. And it's a really great definition for wilderness, in my opinion. And the act established the National Wilderness Preservation System. It mandated all the federal agencies, the Forest Service, the BLM, the National Park, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, to review lands for inclusion in the National Wilderness Preservation System. The Forest Service did a great job in this. And in 65, they established the Rare Two uh, Review, Roadless Area Review and Evaluation. And that fundamentally is the start of the designation of wilderness areas in our national forests. And 
In the United States, the U.S. Forest Service promptly was able to come up with 445 wilderness areas. The BLM 224, a little behind Park Service, which is interesting because we actually have wilderness areas in the national parks. Part of Rocky Mountain National Park is a wilderness area. And that designation is key because it controls what is allowed to happen there. Um, access, motorized vehicles, that sort of stuff. In Colorado, we're blessed with 35 wilderness areas occupying almost 3 million acres. Not much as far as the BLM goes. The national parks have four. Like I said, Rocky Mountain National Park has a wilderness area in it. None for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The 2000 Act, which was passed to try and get the BLM a little more excited about identifying and classifying uh, wilderness areas, has done its job. And right now the BLM has 54 areas in review in Colorado. The U.S. Forest Service, which is the dominant federal management uh, agency in Colorado, is actually with the Department of Agriculture, not the Department of the Interior. There's some politics behind that, but forests were consider an, considered an agricultural resource, so the Department of Agriculture ended up with it. It originally started in 1891 with the Forest Reserve Act, which looked around and identified forest reserves for public domain. And these were generally the forested and mountainous areas that nobody had homesteaded. And the federal government decided they would take management of those forests for timber mining and other production. The 1897 Organic Act established the rules governing the forest reserves under the Department of the Interior. But in 1905, that responsibility was transferred to the Department of Agriculture under Gifford Pinchot, who was basically the father of the Forest Service. It took Gifford Pinchot 12 years to create the modern U.S. Forest Service, but he did it. Nationally, the U.S. Forest Service is responsible for 155 forests, 20 national grasslands, and a total of 193 million acres. In Colorado, we have 11 national forests for 14 and a half million acres. Arapaho, Grand Mesa, Gunnison, Pike, Rio Grande, Roosevelt. You most of you are probably familiar with these. We also have 35 wilderness areas, almost 3 million acres. We have two national grasslands, Comanche National Grasslands down in the southeast part of the state and Pawnee up in the northeast part of the state. Here's the U.S. Forest Service land in Colorado. You can see it occupies fairly significant amount of land. Um, these are the front range right here. This little hole right here in the Forest Service is Rocky Mountain National Park. But this is where most of us do, do our hiking, climbing, it's where the 14ers are. The activities on U.S. Forest Service non-wilderness lands are, are quite inclusive. It's pretty open. You can hike, fish, raft, hunt, horses are okay, camping, climbing, dogs, as long as they're under control. It doesn't mean they have to be leashed, but they do have to be under control. You can have mechanical transport, some restrictions though, but generally you can have four by fours, ATVs, motorcycles, bicycles, power boats, that sort of stuff. You can generally run motors with, again, some restrictions, but these include chainsaws and generators. They do timber harvesting, which was one of the major goals of management of the forests, and cattle grazing. 
They also allow mineral exploration and extraction. Now here in the dark green are the wilderness areas that are included inside the US Forest Service lands. You can see that all these fall inside the national forests and occupy about a fourth of the national forests. Now the activities on the wilderness lands for the US Forest Service are more restricted. Yes, hiking, fishing, rafting, hunting, horses, camping, climbing, dogs under control, on a leash. They have to be on a leash in the wilderness areas. There's no mechanical transports, no four by fours, ATVs, motorcycles, bicycles, nothing mechanical. The Wilderness Act does not say no internal combustion engines, no motors. It says mechanical transport. That's why bicycles are included in this. This is a point of contention for a lot of people, but it's the reason they're not allowed. There's no motors, period, no chainsaws, no generators. There is no timber harvesting in the wilderness areas. There is cattle grazing, but that again goes back to cattle rights, cattle grazing rights that existed before the wilderness area was declared. There's no new mineral exploration and extraction, but it is subject to existing rights. If somebody already had a mine in there, uh, they're allowed to continue. Usually when you go into a wilderness, you will come across a sign like this. And this is the Popo Aggie Wilderness up in Wyoming, the Shoshone National Forest. And there'll be a little box here with a, a registration card. And a lot of them look something like this, and they'd like you to fill them out. Uh, I'd like you to fill them out too, because this is how the Forest Service keep tra keeps track of who's in there. And the more people using it, the more political clout we'll have to ensure that they're protected. So when you can, and you go into the wilderness and they have this, go ahead and sign in. Sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes there's just a sign. And this is the sign into the Bob Marshall Wilderness, Lewis and Clark National Forest up in Montana, where you leave the forest land into the wilderness designation and there's no sign in or anything, just, a, just this little wood sign. The US Forest Service fees are pretty simple. Generally no entrance fees to use the national forest wilderness areas. However, there are some exceptions. The Mount Evans area is national forest, but it's managed jointly and that's a fee. The Vail I-70 parking area, they actually have a, a parking fee up there, but the interagency pass may be valid. I've heard both that it's not, but I'm not sure exactly. Campground fees, generally 10 to $12, $20. Backcountry camping is generally free in both national forests and national forest wilderness areas. The Bureau of Land Management, another big land manager in the West. And they were created out of a merger of the Grazing Service, created in the 1930s, and the General Land Office, which goes all the way back to 1785. But the BLM was created in 1946 as a bureau within the Department of the Interior. It's responsible for management of public lands not identified as part of U.S. Forest Service, national parks, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. The BLM generally manages a lot of the open range land of the West, um, a lot of the drier areas, um, areas where you can have cattle, um, but usually water is the limiting factor. The BLM oversees the 2009 National Landscape Conservation System, which was a further enhancement of the Wilderness Act. And the BLM also manages national monuments, not just the Park Service, 27 of 129, manages 
one wilderness areas, but as part of the 2000-2009 National Landscape Conservation System, they now have 528 areas in review that might become wilderness. Overall, it manages 247 million acres, but manages the mineral rights on 700 million acres, a lot of land. In Colorado, we have two national monuments, Browns Canyon, in the Canyon of the H Ancients, uh, three national conservation areas, I won't go through all this, and two national scenic and historic trails. The BLM manages five wilderness areas, Black Ridge Canyon, Dominique Canyon, Gunnison Gorge, Powderhorn, the Uncompadre, these are down in the San Juans. Again, 52 areas are under study to be wilderness areas in Colorado. This is the BLM land, the dark brown, managed in the state of Colorado. See, most of it is in the far western part of the state, around the Grand Junction area. Interestingly enough, the BLM is in the project process of moving their headquarters from Washington out to Grand Junction. Activities on BLM non-wilderness land. It's all very similar to the US Forest Service. Hiking, fishing, rafting, hunting, horses, all of it. Dogs under control. They don't have to be on a leash, but they do have to be under control. You can have mechanical transport, Four by fours, ATVs, motorcycles, bicycles, power boats, that sort of stuff. Motors are okay, chainsaws, generators. Timber harvesting and cattle grazing. Cattle grazing being the big thing on BLM because most of it's rangeland. Mineral exploration and extraction. This is where the big oil drilling, natural gas boom has been lately. A lot of BLM land. BLM also has wilderness areas. The dark brown here are the wilderness areas. You can see there aren't a lot of them, but there are a number that are under consideration. These are just a few, the darker brown ones that are under consideration for wilderness status. BLM wilderness lands. Again, hiking, fishing, rafting, hunting horses, camping, climbing, dogs under control, leash. Dogs have to be on a leash in wilderness areas, including the BLM wilderness areas. No mechanical transports, no four by fours, ATVs, motorcycles, nothing. No motors, no chainsaws, no generators. No timber harvesting. Yes, they still do cattle grazing on the BLM land. No mineral exploration and extraction subject to existing rights. This has been a bone of contention recently because there are so many areas in BLM land in consideration for wilderness that they would take them out of mineral exploration, notably oil and gas drilling. So there's a lot of political activity going along in this area. The Bureau of Land Management fees, generally no entrance fees to BLM land. However, there are exceptions and they're classified as special use areas. The interagency pass may be valid and I'll go over the interagency pass here in a little bit. Again, BLM campground fees run 10 to $20. And these are, are developed campgrounds, you know, a lot of them have water, a lot of them have restrooms. The National Park Service is another bureau within the Department of the Interior. It was created by the Organic Act of 1916. It's responsible for national parks, battlefields, historic places. Most of the responsibilities of the National Park Service were previously done by the U.S. Army. And you may have noticed that the National Park Service uniform is a little unusual and the wide brimmed hat that they wear. If you go back and look at the army uniform, 
1916. You'll find it's very similar to this National Park Service, especially the hat. But that's why the Park Service uniform is the, the brown and, and dark green with that particularly notable hat. The Park Service is also responsible for most national monuments designated under the 1906 Antiquities Acts. Uh, the 1906 Antiquities Act was signed by Teddy Roosevelt, TR here, and it was signed particularly to try and, and protect a place called Chaco, Chaco Canyon down in New Mexico. And it's called the Antiquities Act because people were basically raiding the old Native American um, sites. They were pot hunters and uh, mainly pot hunters. And they would go into the old native areas and just dig them up and make a mess out of them. And so they passed the 1906 Antiquities Act. And the first place Teddy Roosevelt put off limits was Chaco Canyon. Since then, it's been used by numerous presidents to protect areas. Matter of fact, it was used to protect uh, the Grand Canyon. It was originally declared a national monument under the 1906 Antiquities Act. So they had time to protect it before it actually became a park. So the National Park Service manages 59 national parks, 88 of our 129 national monuments, a total of 81 million acres. Again, a lot of that is in, is in Alaska. Our four great Colorado national parks, Rocky Mountain, Great Sand Dunes, Mesa Verde, down by, uh, um, oh, down in South Central Colorado, and the Black Canyon of the Gunnison over by Gunnison, Colorado. Four beautiful places you should all check out. We have a number of national monuments, Dinosaur National Monument in the western part of the state, Colorado National Monument, which is a little taste of Moab and, and uh, Canyonlands of Utah. It's just a gorgeous area. The Forest Sand Fossil Beds down south, Brands Canyon, Canyon of the Ancient, Hoven Weep, Yucca, Chimney Rock. These are all down in the southwest corner of Colorado and all associated with uh, the ancient Native Americans that lived there. Here's our national parks and monuments. A lot of the monuments are too small, especially the ones down here in, uh, the, associated with the Native Americans. They just don't show up here. This is Great Sand Dunes, Rocky Mountain. This is Dinosaur over here. Activities in the national parks are a little more restricted than Forest Service or BLM land. As you can imagine, they get a lot more use, so they have to have a lot stricter controls on people. So hiking, fishing, rafting, horses, limited trails, camping, designated areas only, climbing in limited areas, limited mechanical transport, back road, you can do four by fours, ATVs, motorcycles, and bicycles. There are some power boats allowed on some of the lakes in the national parks. You can have motors, chainsaws, generators, mostly restricted to designated camping areas. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no hunting in the national parks. Dogs are restricted to the developed areas only. That's usually parking lots and campgrounds. There's no timber harvesting or cattle grazing in the national parks. There's no mineral exploration, no extraction. This is uh, one of the backcountry trails. This is Canyonlands, um, Island in the Sky, and this is the Schaefer Trail from Island in the Sky down, oh, ultimately over to Moab. But this is where you can go backcountry, four by four, motorcycle or bicycle riding. In the wilderness lands, 
in the national parks. More restrictions, hiking, fishing, rafting, horses, on designated trails, limited trails, camping only in designated areas, climbing in limited areas. There's no mechanical transport, four by fours, ATVs, anything like that. No motors, no chainsaws, no generators, no hunting, dogs again in developed areas only, that is generally parking lots and campgrounds. No timber harvesting or cattle grazing, no mineral exploration or extraction. The National Park Service fees, the National Park and the other federal agencies offer an interagency annual pass for $80. Now, interagency is just what it says. It's good for the Forest Service, the BLM, the National Park Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Daily or weekly passes generally run $10 to $40. They have a senior interagency lifetime pass for $80 now. Um, I actually got one of these a while back and it was $5 when I got it. The senior interagency annual pass for $20 is a great deal because you can get into all the parks. Campground fees generally $10 to $20. And a lot of times in the parks, they will have a backcountry camping fees. Not always, but sometimes. It can be up to $7. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the uh, smaller organization of the four federal agencies. It was created in 1940 by merger of the U.S. Commission on Fisheries, which was originally started in 1871 to protect fishing along our coastal areas, and the Biological Survey, which was created in 1896. It's a bureau in the Department of the Interior. It's responsible for our national wildlife refuge system. Over 560 refuges and thousands of small wetlands and other special management areas. It manages 150 million acres. 553 and 8.3 million acres in the lower 48. There are eight national wildlife reserves in Colorado. Most of them are associated with waterfowl and it's to try and make sure all the water that is needed for cities and agricultures doesn't strictly just go to cities and agriculture and some of it is left for the wildlife, particularly the migratory birds that travel through the state. These are a list of the uh, refuges, Alamosa, Arapaho, Baca, Browns Park. Two Ponds is an interesting National Wildlife Reservoir. It's actually located in Denver, Denver area, at Kipling and 80th. Avenue, I believe. I think that's that's Arvada. I think it's it's in the middle of a pretty much an urban area. You notice that the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and Rocky Flats have both been designated National Wildlife Reservoirs reserves also. And here in in the, the greenish blue are the refuges. Uh, this right here is the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal. This over here is Rocky Flats. The two ponds, which is about here, is too small to show up. You've got the Alamosa Reservoir down here. This is massive wetlands for migrating um, storks, herons, and other wildlife. Um, Baca and the Browns Canyon. Activities on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service land, non-wilderness. Now, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife lands are a little different because they're set up to try and, and uh, support hunting and fishing. So hiking and wildlife viewing is encouraged hunting's encouraged limited fishing but 
It's also encouraged in the areas that it's allowed. Camping, hunting dogs allowed uh, for uh, game hunting. Limited mechanical transport, back roads, four by fours, ATVs, power boats, but it's all limited to the back roads. <clears throat> you can't have motors, chainsaws, generators, no timber harvesting or cattle grading, no mineral exploration and extraction. US Force, the US Fish and Wildlife Service also has wilderness lands. There are none in Colorado. But again, just a little tighter restrictions. You can hike, wildlife view, hunt, limited fishing, camping, but as in the other wilderness areas, no mechanical transports, no four by fours, no motorcycles, bicycles, no power, no motors, no timber harvest. You notice the pattern here that basically the wilderness areas, uh, the purpose is to limit what activities can take place that might cause any long-term damage or disrupt the natural system. I mean, that's really what the goal of the Wilderness Act was about, where man is just a visitor and leaves. Again, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service fees, most refuges do not charge an entrance fee. However, those that do will honor the interagency pass. Campgrounds in the uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service areas are 10 to $20, but many of the refuges do not have campgrounds. Um, they've just determined that they're too small and that continuous presence of campers would just be too much of a disruption to the wildlife. Uh, subject we should address here um, when dealing with federal lands and management is a term called inholdings. Um, I'm sure you've all come across them, hiking. Uh, you'd be walking or driving you up a forest road and you'll come to a uh, set of houses and these are generally inholdings. Uh, inholding is a privately owned land inside the boundary of a national park, national forest, state park, or similarly publicly owned protected area. Inholdings result from a private ownership of lands predating the designation of a park or forest area or the expansion of the park area to, uh, to encompass the privately owned property. Um, many of our national parks have inholdings, that is people that had through the Homestead Act or other mining activities uh, end up owning um, land inside. And they're tolerated by everybody and can be valuable in providing um, hotels and um, restaurants and things like that. But, uh, on the other hand, uh, they have been the subject of much discussion in that some people have wanted to do massive developments on these inholdings. So there's a lot of laws that restrict what you can do, even though it is private property. Usually you are limited to development that matches the original footprint of any buildings or structures that might have been there. Uh, there's inholdings in Grand Teton National Park where somebody would probably try and throw up a huge hotel in the middle of the park if, uh, if they were allowed to. So inholdings while private are restricted in uh, what they can and cannot do. Most of these inholdings derive from the Homestead Act or the General Mining Act. This is down in the San Juan, it's the Red Mountain Mining District. I'm sure most of you that hiked in the back country have come across these old mines. These predate 
the establishment, many times they predate the establishment of the national forest system, certainly predate the wilderness area legislation. And most of them are abandoned at this stage. Uh, Colorado is littered with thousands of these abandoned mining operations. Unfortunately, a lot of them, the old shafts still drain water and that water is, is very acidic, very high in heavy metals and can cause a significant problem for area streams and uh, fish populations. Colorado State Lands is another uh, management. Now this is, this is a state agency. Uh, in 1876, Colorado became a state and under the Land Ordinance Act, back to 1785, the state is granted one section, one square mile for every township, which consists of 36 square miles. Usually it's the middle section, 16, and that's why in that one map we saw so all those little red dots, pin dots, those are that section 16 of those townships. The Land Grant Universities Acts of 1862 also provided additional land to the states to be used to fund agriculture and, and engineering schools, to basically build the agriculture and engineering school. And throughout the West, most of our uh, colleges and now universities uh, were originally built using money made from land granted under this Land Grant University Act. <clears throat> the total land granted to the state was almost 4 million acres and a little less than 6% of the state's total volume. Present day state lands total approximately 3 million acres. So these are state trusts. Only about a half a million acres of those are open to the public. Most of them are leased for mining and private development purposes. These are the state lands. Again, you can see all these little dots out here. This is a, these are all one acres or one square mile in a 36 mile township. So they're scattered all over. Two and a half million acres of Colorado state lands is leased for agricultural minerals, oil, and gas. This is why they're generally closed to the public. About a half a million acres are for park and wildlife, include 350 wildlife areas and 42 parks. These are the Colorado state parks. Most of them are quite tiny and don't really show up very well. This is the largest one up here up in the North Park along the edge of the Never Summer Mountains. Again, activities, hiking, wildlife viewing, fishing, horses, trails, camping, designated areas. Climbing, dogs under control, must be on a leash. Limited mechanical transport, usually boats and bicycles are all that are allowed. There's Generally not ATVs and four by fours in the state parks. There are motors with restrictions, boats and generators, no hunting, no timber harvesting, no mineral exploration or extraction. These are the Colorado State Wildlife Refuges. They occupy two and a half million acres scattered around. And like I said, most of these are areas where there's particular uh, mammals to be protected, like bighorn sheep or an elk herd, or there's a water resource that is needed for migrating wildlife, particularly ducks, geese. The activities allowed, always check with the individual state wildlife areas for restrictions, but as I said, the Parks and Wildlife, part of their goal is to encourage hunting and fishing. So a lot of these areas during hunting and fishing times, you can access them for both. 
Hiking, wildlife viewing, limited horse trails, camping, designated areas only, limited dogs for hunting, hunting dogs, limited mechanical transport, vehicles and bikes, motors with restrictions, generators generally, no timber harvesting, no mineral exploration. Fees for the Colorado State Land Parks and Wildlife Refuges. Daily individual passes are usually three to seven dollars, a vehicle pass seven to nine, annual pass seventy dollars, Aspen annual pass, that's for people, plus sixty-four, sixty dollars. There's discounts for disabled and military. Again, the campground fees are twelve to twenty-six dollars. They do charge a backcountry camping in a lot of the Colorado State Parks for ten dollars. Hiking is really our primary pursuit with the Colorado Mountain Club. This happens to be a shot up in Glacier National Park. So the general hiking guidelines, guidelines, excuse me, U.S. Forest Service and BLM, try and use the maintained trails, but off-trail hiking is allowed. So on regular U.S. Forest Service and BLM land, you can go cross country, but they do encourage you to use the maintained trails. However, in the national parks, you're restricted to the maintained trails. Off-trail hiking is generally not allowed. There's too many people and they just have trails going every place. People were allowed to just wander off. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, again, generally restricted to maintain trails, but limited off-trail hiking associated with hunting and fishing is allowed. The state parks and refugees, generally restricted to maintain trails, but limited off-trail hiking associated with hunting and fishing. Camping is also important in the backcountry. So there's some general camping guidelines. U.S. Forest Service and BLM, numerous designated campgrounds, but generally open camping in the backcountry. National Park Service, designated campgrounds and assigned locations in the backcountry. This key assigned here. If you're going backcountry camping in the parks, you have to check in with the rangers and be assigned a camp location. U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Service, generally it's only designated campgrounds. They really don't have open backcountry camping. State Park and, Rec and Refugees, designated campground also. Some assigned locations in the backcountry. The Leave No Trace policy. This was a policy developed in the 60s originally for the wilderness areas and designated into the Wilderness Act um, as the Leave No Trace. It's since been expanded. And we, we try and go by it on all public lands. That is pack out all your trash, use a stove instead of a fire. Now we're not saying if your stove isn't working and you're in the national forest, um, you can go ahead and build a fire, but uh, if you're in the park service, you can't. Camp 200 feet, feet away from water, use marked trails, limit your group size. Just good common sense. Back road travel. This is Canyonlands National Park, and here's the one of the roads going down in there. This is the uh, White Rim Trail. Uh, this is the White Rim Sandstone right here. It's a big bike riding trail. Uh, used to be a big ATV. ATVs still do it, but uh, it's gotten much more, much more popular with bikes lately. Guidelines for back road travel, 4x4s, ATVs, motorcycles, e-bikes. Big key here, no vehicles allowed in wilderness areas. That's U.S. Forest Service, BLM, National Parks. 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. No vehicles allowed in wilderness areas. No off-road tr vehicle travel. Not anymore. It used to be you could do a little bit of four-wheeling off on national U.S. National Forest Service land or BLM land. It's generally discouraged now, if not just outright banned, and vehicles are pretty much restricted to the existing roads. The U.S. Forest Service and BLM back roads are generally open unless marked closed. We need you to stay on the existing roads. National Park Service restricted to designated back roads. Utah's national parks has a lot of back roads. We just saw a picture of that one road and the Schaefer Trail going down. So there are areas to take your four wheel drives and your ATVs and motorcycles back into the parks, but they're quite restricted. U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, again, restricted to designated back roads, wildlife viewing, hunting, and fishing. State park and refuges restricted designated back roads. Hunting and fishing. General hunting and fishing guidelines. Need in your possession a valid state hunting or fishing license. That's just a rule for pretty much every place. Um, the only exception to requirement of a valid state hunting or fishing license is the National Park Service does issue some fishing licenses for individual parks. Yellowstone Park is a good example. Um, it occupies a little bit of Montana, a little bit of, of Idaho, and mostly Wyoming, but you don't need a Wyoming fishing permit there license. You can actually go into the park headquarters and get a three to seven day fishing license for the park. The U.S. Forest Service and BLM, some local restrictions, but generally open for hunting and fishing. There's really not much restrictions. These are your public lands. That's what they're for. The National Park Service, no hunting. That's just a flat rule. There, there is no hunting in the parks. Fishing generally allowed with local restrictions. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, hunting and limited fishing generally encouraged. This is a lot of why this was set up and it's funded by hunters and fishermen through their licenses. But always check the local rules and restrictions. State park and refuges, no hunting in the state parks. Fishing allowed with a Colorado license in Colorado. Hunting and limited fishing encouraged in the state refuges. So there are refuges where you can hunt. They're usually controlled. They usually have a limited number of, let's say, waterfall blinds, duck blinds, where uh, bird hunters can uh, register and use. Dogs are great hiking companions. However, dogs and wildlife is the real issue. Here's some general guidelines for dogs. U.S. Forest Service and BLM lands. Welcome in most areas, but must be under control. And in wilderness areas, must be on a leash. Um, you don't have to have your dog on a leash if you're just in the National Forest or in BLM land, unless you're in a wilderness area. But they do have to be under your control. They can't be just running around wild. Remember, the issue is really dogs and wildlife. In the national parks, generally dogs are restricted to parking and service areas, that is park parking and campground areas. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, generally dogs restricted to parking and service areas. Again, they don't want the dogs chasing the wildlife. 
some limited hunting dog access, state parks and refuge, burial, but generally on a leash, some dog parks in some of the state parks, limited access to both. Bikes have become common in the backcountry. General guidelines, key, bikes are not allowed in wilderness areas. On other US Forest Service and BLM, they're allowed on roads, back roads, trails, horse trails, unless otherwise marked. In the National Park Service, it's designated roads and back roads only. In the US Fish and Wildlife areas, designated roads and back roads, and the same with state parks and refuges. Note, e-bikes are considered a motorized vehicle for most practical purposes as far as the federal agencies go. Um, it used to be you could take your bike um, a little off-road, just the same as you used to be able to hike a lot more off-road. Um, there's just so many more people using our federal lands now and so much more activities uh, that things have just had to uh, tighten up some of the rules and regulations due to overuse in a lot of areas. This is a table I put together that just sort of summarizes um, what we've been going through here. And you can see we go from blue, which is basically no restrictions, to yellow, some restrictions, to red, not allowed. And you can see that the U.S. Forest Service land, uh, non-wilderness, uh, most things are allowed, mineral and gas, cattle, timber, motors, back road vehicles, fishing, hunting, all this is just open. You move into the U.S. Forest Service wilderness areas and you get a few more restrictions on the back road vehicles, no motors, no timber, no mineral and oil. Same with BLM land, all blue here for most BLM land, but you go into the BLM wilderness, the same as the U.S. Forest Service, restrictions on no back road vehicles, no motors, no timber, no mineral and gas. National Park Service, a little more restricted. Wilderness areas, a little more. So this is just a summation um, for uh, a quick look to see how the rules work. If you want more information on any of this, these are just a few of the websites that I use for the U.S. Forest Service. We've got forestservice.fed.us for the BLM, for the National Park Service. This is their, these are their websites. Um, and for those of you that would like U.S. Geological Survey topo maps, this is a website you can go to and pull up the topo maps for any area, that you, any area in the United States. Uh, go to the website and at the top click, click on Get Maps. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Um, if you download this and, and print it or whatever, there's a few more slides in here that I thought would be interesting. This is a little on the, more on the history and the expansion of the United States and where all our land came from and why a lot of it is, is federal. Um, a lot of it is federal because we either bought it or we annexed it from another country. <laughs> and this is a, a, a little summary slide of how the land survey and designation works um, as far as uh, the township uh, and uh, range designation for our land surveys in the West. And again, this is uh, how the baseline and principal meridian works for our land surveys in the West. This is for the state of Montana. Each one of these little squares right here is 36 square miles. It's six miles by six miles. 
contains 36 sections, which is a square mile or 640 acres. And this is a standard Forest Service map. Uh, here, half an inch equals one mile. And these are these little sections. This is a mile by a mile, designating a square mile. And the color um, shows you ownership. The green, the light green, is national forest. The dark green is wilderness area. The brown here, this is Rocky Mountain National Park down here. Here's Lake Granby. Um, the yellow, I think, is BLM here. I, I can't quite recall. The yellow, I think, is BLM. And the white is privately owned land. But this is the standard survey, land survey, and designation system for the Western United States. And here's one of the topo maps uh, here produced by the U.S. Geological Survey, which are available on that line on that website. This is Golden. This is the town of Golden here. And this is North Table Mesa and South Table Mesa. And uh, you can see the grid system here. But these are all available free online. And that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer. Um, don't know how well I'll do, but uh, I'll sure give it a shot. Thank, thanks, Gary. I think uh, what we can do if people want to rather ask questions uh, through audio, we can do that because we have a manageable crowd. Okay, um, but, sure. But we, have, uh, we have one question in the chat box. Um, David is asking, what activities are allowed on those scattered state section lands? On, uh, um, let's see, on state lands? No, I think he meant those little red dots. Oh, okay. Those little red dots are, are uh, subject to, here, let me go here. Uh, this this activities for state lands. Um, if they're open to the public, most of those little dots are, you notice they're out in the east and most of them have been leased for uh, mineral exploration, basically drilling. So most of those areas are off limits as are, you know, 80% really of the state lands. Um, but if they are open to the public, then these activities for standard state lands, let me go back here. Uh, Still, a fly, still apply, whether it's uh, designated a refuge or just uh, a state land. Let's see here. It's a good point. I sort of lumped uh, state lands into uh, either parks or refugees. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And then I guess it's um, always good to look, if you go to a special place, look for the, their website because they might have local restrictions that supersede the Mm -hmm. what, you know, the, the table you showed or the, the slide you showed. Um, I know from, for instance, from Roxborough State Park, um, there are no dogs allowed whatsoever, not even leashed in that park, which supersedes the general idea of, yeah, you, ha you can have dogs, but they need to be on a leash, for instance. Right, right. Um, as far as the Colorado state lands go, I think, I'm not aware of any just simply state lands that are open to the public that are not either part of a refuge or a park. Um, I think pretty much all the other state lands are leased out either for mineral exploration or uh, grazing and are therefore pretty much off limits. 
Makes sense. Any other questions, folks? The the um, PowerPoint or the, the PDF and that video will be available. I know there was a lot of information, but I think uh, it's very well summarized on uh, Gary's slide. So w once I get the uh, PDF from Gary, I'll probably will uh, print out a couple of those slides that are relevant for me, especially the table at the end is a nice little summary um, that you can use when you do your trip planning, for instance. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for this, those of you that joined us. Hey, Gary, there's a couple of more questions on the chat. Um, David, oh. was asked, David was asking if you can bring a Chihuahua to use fish and wildlife lands and claim it as a hunting dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, Probably, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe if you put them in ca camouflage gear or something, like that. <laughs> that that'd be a good question. You know. <laughs> so, as as a as a geologist, I of course want to know where I can actually collect rocks. Um, is there is there a guideline there for those different parks? Well, um, generally, yeah. I didn't address that, did I? Um, in uh, uh, Forest Service land, both uh, non-wilderness and wilderness, and BLM, non-wilderness and wilderness, uh, yeah, you're open. Uh, not for non-commercial purposes. Right, just if I see yeah, something that's, sparkly. That's the big key there, <laughs> non-commercial purposes. Um, and uh, that may be a little open to interpretation, but they're basically saying you can't put a gravel factory in. You know? Right, right, right. But if you want to pick up some rocks or even pound a few rocks to get samples, that's perfectly fine. Um, however, in the parks and the, the fish and wildlife areas, usually no. You, you can't pick up anything and take it out. Right. Also the wilderness areas, even um, if they're the forest land, forest service both, land? both uh, non-wilderness and wilderness areas. Um, okay. Just uh, in the parks and the state parks, the uh, federal parks and the refuges, uh, generally you can't, you can't take anything out. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Um, that makes sense. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're all good. Um, thanks again, Gary. I really appreciate that. That was really good. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, guys. I'll have a good get, one. Yeah, yeah I'll it, get that PDF to you too. Yeah, whenever you're, uh, yeah, get a chance. Um, um, and the the video will take a few uh, days to edit, anyways. But um, yeah, give me give me the PDF, and then we'll post it, and then it's available to everybody. Okay, great. Thanks. Have a good evening. Okay. Night, Bye. all.